vertical stabiliser installed and now going to put the left hand one in. It's now time to install the canopy which we built right back at the start of the build. It's not hard to figure out what's going to go on here. This little tab here is going to go into that slot here and it's going to sit on like so. The easiest way I've found to do this is to slather the glue on here quite thickly and then place it on pull it off and that leaves a residue of glue on the correct outline and then you can just go and smear that around, add a bit more if you need to, then put some on the tab here and lock it down. So I've put an excessive amount of glue on here, that's by design. I haven't put any in the slot or the tab yet, I'll just get it into position, press it down so that the glue is transferred, lift him off. And now I can just use that guideline to uh, see where the glue has to go. Look, there's enough there. I put enough on in the first instance. So I'm just going to smear it out and make sure it's okay. We've now got our glue around the uh, outline of the canopy on the fuselage top and glue around the edges where it's going to uh, connect. And I've placed a bit of glue onto this little extrusion of foam here. I'm just smearing it around the edges. And now we're ready just to install the canopy. Press it into place, line it up so that it runs true down the middle of the um, fuselage and just press it down gently. And a little bit of tape will just help to keep it in place. There we go, we'll let that dry. These are the control horns that we're going to use for this build and these came in the RC Foamfly kit. These are standard Hobby King baseline control horns which are not too bad. I've used them in the past. They are a little bit on the flexible side and you just need to be sure they're glued in really well uh, because they can pull out of the foam if you're not careful. But look they work okay and I'm certainly going to use them in this build because they're part of the kit. I have to confess that I'm a bit of a fiend for collecting different styles of control horns. As you can probably see from this uh, box, I've got clevises of several different types and I've got a whole bunch of control horns of different varieties. Ones that go on by screw, others that just glue in, plunge style. This is my current favourite. It's also from Hobby King. It's a plunge style with a clip on the back, but they are very strong and with a touch of glue, they will last beyond any crash that uh, you might find yourself in. Really great control horns and very rigid. But look, you choose your own. The ones that came in the kit are just fine. Now the first thing we're going to do is work out the length of our control rod. I've already done a, a test fit and so I know that I've got it about right. It would probably still need a bit of trimming but I've, I've cut it down to a manageable length. And the step that I think is most important here is to place the control horn so that the pivot point, that is where the clevis links to the control horn, is directly over the hinge line. If you do it differently, you get a different angle of attack on the, um, on the control surface as the servo moves. And if you do them differently in different parts of the plane, it can be a real nightmare to get the plane trimmed out properly. So standardize it by placing the point where you secure the clevis or whatever it is you've used to attach it directly over the hinge line. So the way I do this is I just look at the line that the control rod is going to take and standing directly overhead I look down and roughly position the control horn and then I just give it a bit of a wiggle into the foam to leave a mark just there. With that mark made I'll take a, a scalpel, this is useful a, a long pointed blade like this and I'll just plunge that straight through. Like so. Then take your control horn and at this point you might want to think about some glue but I'm just going to do a test fit for you and just excuse my hands in the way again. There we go. I've shoved it through and I'm double checking to make sure that the holes are directly over the hinge and that looks good. So if we just lift up the aeroplane, 
you can see that little tongue there has emerged. There's not much of it there, so we've got to double, uh, double check by gluing that to make sure it is secure, but it'll be all right. So that's what we're going to do. I'm going to mix up a little bit of glue now, some epoxy, because that's what I like to use on these. Okay, so that control horn is epoxied in, that's not going anywhere, and that nice bath of glue around the base of it will um, add to the surface tension and the surface area that the control horn can act on. So that'll be terrific. The glue around the base of the control horn has been curing for a number of minutes now and that looks terrific. So I'm happy with that. We're ready now to do the connection of the push rod uh, and the clevis to the control horn. Just one little tip. One of the things that is uh, sometimes inclined to happen on RC planes is that the clevis will come undone. Sometimes the little uh, peg there that passes through the control horn might break. Uh, one way around that I've discovered is just to use a short section of shrink tube and uh, once I've got the control rod in place, and I'm going to put it on the bottom hole in this case, just clip it closed, then I slide the piece of shrink tube up and over and on some, ca some cases, you can just leave it like that. But I usually just hit it with a heat gun. I just put a piece of card or something underneath to protect the foam, give it a blast with a heat gun, and that really does crimp down on it, and it, there is no way then that that's gonna come undone on you. So all I'm doing is just protecting the foam with a little bit of um, scrap ply that I have, and give it a hit. I've gone ahead now and installed the control horns into the elevons as well and run the control rods up through that little angle that is used to secure the fin and that runs up to the relevant servo horn up there. So um, that will provide a nice straight run for the elevon and because these rods are quite thick there shouldn't be any flex at all. I'm now going to go on and install the control linkages for the rudders. Now there's a couple of little issues here. Where we've got our end stopper down here where our servo uh, control rod might go is clearly, even if we angle it a bit, below the, the rudder area. So we've got to have to bend this in some way or other. There is another way around it. I have tried it. It's where you angle the whole survey, you glue it in at an angle, but I found that not to be very satisfactory. One of the things that I've noticed that Dave Powers does on his planes is produce a sort of a lazy S bend to control it that way, and um, that works pretty well. I asked Dave how he goes in bending the metal to the correct shape and to get it the same on both sides, because if they're different, you tend to get different rates of throw in the rudder. His suggestion is to use just a, a practice with some soft metal. This is a very soft piece of copper wire, but it's sufficient for the task. The idea is that you use this just to get the rough shape. So it's going to go down through the, the, uh, the linkage down on the servo, come up at an angle, and then revert to the horizontal to engage with the servo. I'm sorry, with the control horn. So that looks to be about the right shape. And uh, what I'll do now is use that as a template to bend two pieces of the thicker control rod to the correct shape. I haven't glued anything yet, this is just a dry fit. So the control horn's in about the right place and the angles seem okay. I might need to do some fine tune adjusting once I energise the servos to see if there's any binding but that looks pretty good. So I go ahead and glue all that up now and repeat it on the other vertical stabiliser. I've now finished putting the control linkages onto those rudders and they've turned out pretty well. We'll finish off all of those, including the aileron and elevon servos, by tightening up the linkages once we've energised the system a bit later on in the build. 
We are almost to the end of the build now. One of the last things to be installed is the hatch for the electronics bay. Now the way this thing works is that it is placed on like so and hinged at the front here, which I haven't done yet of course. And the way it's fastened is by using magnets, one mounted here on the top of the motor mount and the other one on the underside of the hatch itself so that when we drop the hatch down it just snaps nicely into place. It's also held in place by the friction of these lugs here, these two flanges which engage with those slots there and that can double up the uh, friction to make sure we get a nice secure hatch there. So what we're going to do now is position the magnets. The easiest way to do that is to sit the magnets you intend to use, the two of them together, so they're already um, like um, poles in opposite directions so they're attracting each other and what I'm going to do is just place the hatch in the correct position and then press down and that will do two things it will leave an indent in the foam of the motor mount and leave another indent in the underside of the hatch cover so when we pull it away we can see the little indent there and we've got a similar outcome down here. What we'll do now is just remove a little bit of foam and then glue the two magnets in place. One of the easiest ways I've found to get the foam out of this little depression here on the hatch is simply to cut around the extremities with a blade put a couple of cuts through and then just use the same old method that we used to remove the foam from the wing for the wing spar just to peel out a shallow amount of the foam. Don't go too crazy because you'll dig a hole right through. There we go and that'll press in nicely. Just use a little bit of hot glue. finishing touch for the magnets is just to add a piece of tape just to uh, help it not come away from the foam. I use this fiberglass reinforced tape which works pretty well and a small strip for this one. The only step now to finish our hatch is to put the hinge in place and I'm going to use some of our old friend drywall mesh and some foam tack. Doesn't hurt to be a bit liberal with the foam tack on this hinge I've found. It gets used a lot, at least a couple of times every flight. As we move towards finishing off the build of this RC Powers F18, one of the steps that is always important I think is to balance the propeller. Now if you haven't got a propeller balancing tool it would be really wise to get one this one's uh, made by Jubro um, they're not very expensive and they are just brilliant you just clamp the the prop in between these two cones held on with a spring and it'll sit there and, and give you an indication of what the balance of the propeller is and as you place it on there if it tends to swing on its own well you know you've got a heavy blade on one end one side of the propeller and the reason this is important is that that causes vibration when it spins. That's tough on the motor, tends to break down the mount that the motor uses to secure to the foam and is also more noisy. So it's always useful to spend a bit of time finessing your propeller. All you need is um, a couple of grades of sandpaper, um, rough and slightly smoother. I've made a start on this. The important thing I'd say is that when you are taking some of the uh, plastic away, Try to work in the back of the blade. All right, we know the front of the blade is where the little bit of writing is that tells us the size. This is a 6x4E, E for electric. Try to uh, take it from the back and don't change the profile of the blade if you can. Just work into the sort of spoon there and take it away, take it away, a little bit at a time and uh, you'll get there. Sometimes you need to just also take a bit off the hub. Uh, some people use a bit of tape 
to weight one side. That also works. I just prefer a nice clean blade. Uh, I'll keep working on this one now. I'm almost there. I'm just trying to um, just smooth it out a bit now because I have been taking a bit of the, uh, the plastic away. And you just keep working like that and just keep testing it until you're happy. And you know you're happy when it'll sit. There we go. I think I might have cracked it. When it'll sit in any position without rotating. If this had a heavy blade on one side, it would rotate by itself and just drop the heavy blade to the bottom. There we go. My blade's balanced. Always a useful thing to do. I want to correct something that I told you earlier in the video about the placement of the servos, particularly these servos here, which are for the elevons or elevators. I said then that I always place my servos so that the wires are going forward from that part of the servo. Of course, that also means that this mechanism here, including the control horn when fitted, would also have been at the front. I've had to go back in, pop out this servo, flip it over and reinstall the control horn. Why? Because I realised with it in the position I had it previously, with the mechanism up here at the front of the servo, that that would have got in the way of the propeller. If I just pop this propeller into place loosely like that, you'll get the idea. The trouble would have been that with the elevons in their full range of movement, that in going this way, that would have pushed straight back into the propeller, particularly when the control rod here was fitted, which naturally extends a little further beyond that uh, stopper on the end. So that would have been very briefly exciting, rather noisy, but very disappointing. So it does pay to double check and just proves that you can make mistakes if you get complacent, like I did. So I've uh, flipped over both of these servos for the Elevon. The other ones are just fine, and now we're good to go. One of the most important things you need to get right is the placement of the centre of gravity. Now, on the RC Powers plans, they show the centre of gravity very clearly. And even better, on their plans, they show a little notch just here, which is... Um, missing, you cut that out of the foam, so that when you have the plane the correct way up, you can just reach your fingers under the wing and feel for that and place it there and balance the plane to make sure your CG is correct. Unfortunately, that little notch there is missing from the RC Foamfly pre-cut kit and it should just be in here. All I've done, just to get over that, is to glue in place a little rubber bumper or stop. These are usually used to prevent a cupboard door banging or something similar. Just pick this up from the hardware store, self-adhesive little little bumps. And uh, with a touch of hot glue, just to make sure it adheres, I just place that there. And that gives me something to feel for when I've got the plane down at the field and trying to double check that my CG is correct. The first step in setting up the electronics for your plane is to bind your receiver to your radio so that they can talk to each other and therefore control the aeroplane. Now, I'm using this Orange RX 6-channel receiver. I just happen to have a bunch of these on the workbench. You could, of course, use something a bit more upmarket. This is a Spectrum AR6210. That's a really top-class uh, receiver, a bit more pricey. And if you want to go the other direction, a really inexpensive option is the Lemon RX tiny, lightweight 6-channel receiver. I think RC Foamfly also sell this one. And that works great. I've used it in some of my light models, very lightweight planes. But that uh, is not what I'm going to use today. I'm going to go with the Orange RX job. Okay, so I think uh, everyone has seen plenty of videos on this, so I'll just be quick. Firstly, I've already gone into my radio and selected the model that I want to have this plane functioning alongside, uh, set it up as F18 RC Powers. And what we've got to do now is, in the first instance, install a bind plug. That'll come with uh, every receiver you buy. That just goes into the bind slot. Depending on your receiver, uh, that might be in a different location, but mine's just up here. So we've now got a bind plug in, and I've connected my ESC to the throttle plug there so I can get some power to the receiver. It's simply a matter of, firstly, making sure that your radio is off, you then connect power and you'll see that your receiver starts to blink and hoping uh, that you can see that on the video. Then with my train switch or bind switch pressed down, I turn on my radio 
and the two devices will start to talk to each other. I watch the flashes down here. When it stops, I release. The light comes back on and we're bound. This radio and this receiver are now the best of friends and will only talk to each other. I'm now going to move on to connecting the motor leads to the ESC. And there's just um, not much to this. A simple matter of getting the plugs joined up and checking that it's giving you the correct direction of rotation of the motor. You can sometimes get a hint as to which way to go. If you look at your ESC, you might be able to see that it's got a positive symbol for this red one and negative symbol for the black uh, cord here. And I have found that that same polarity sometimes applies to the wires that go to your motor. And so as a general starting out position, I will attempt to match red to red and black to black using the colours here and then throw the yellow one on the middle one. And so I've got a sort of a continuity going on here, red through to red. Now it doesn't always work, depends on the brand, but we'll just, uh, we'll just see how that goes. Alright, how do I know which way the motor needs to turn? I look at the prop. The prop is always going to go on with the lettering and numbering telling us that this is a 6x4 prop on the front and looking at the shape of the blade you can tell that that's going to turn in this direction. Counterclockwise as I look at it from the front of the plane, clockwise as I look at it from the back of the plane. Rather than put the prop on there and risk chopping my fingers off, um, which would be a bit of a disappointment for the day, I've just put a piece of tape on there just so I can see what's going on. So I've got my uh, radio turned on. I'm double checking that I've got the throttle at zero and I'll just make a connection to a battery here. Okay, a little notes, that's a happy sound telling us that we're good. And let's just try and see which way this thing's going to turn. Okay, it's going the wrong way. So my idea of using the red to red didn't work. No big deal. We'll just now swap over the red and the black. You can swap over any two leads. I just tend to work on those ones. So this time I'm going black to red. Red to black. Let's just see what happens now. Okay, we're good. It's turning clockwise from the rear of the plane or counterclockwise from the front. So when the propeller goes on, it's going to turn this way. I now have got my motor set up and functioning correctly and going in the right direction. Now that I've got the motor turning in the right direction, I can go on with connecting the rest of the leads into the receiver. Now this can be a bit of a challenging time if you're new to building. I've found it hard in the past, but over time you just learn what to do. And every time I do a build, I make notes. Now you might think that's a little obsessive. You may be right. Um, this is my diagram for the RC Powers F18 version 4. And that also provides for me the mixers that go in my radio so I can have flapper-ons and spoiler-ons and with another diagram that I'm not showing right now I can mix the rudders up to have uh, a V-tail effect. Um, I'm going to go with a simple linked rudder arrangement on this model but separate elevators and ailerons so that I can have that flapper-on and spoiler-on effect and also switch between elevators and elevons. By the way, I have diagrams for the, um, the MiG-29, the SU-30, all of the RC Powers fleet and indeed every plane I build. I will post a link in the video description of where you can get this diagram and uh, hopefully that will be helpful to you. Alright, we'll just put that aside and get on with it. Now, I've got a number of servo extension leads still attached here. Some of these I will leave on, some will come off. I just like to have a bit of room to work with. I'm not trying to um, do it with the receiver already installed. Just get it all set up on top of the aeroplane and uh, life will be simpler for you. So I'm just going to follow my diagram here, plug all the wires in and uh, we'll see how that goes. And if you choose to find the link for that diagram for the wiring, you can follow along. Before I go on putting the rest of my wiring together, I will mention one thing about going for an Elevon only setup. 
This requires only two servos and it's a terrific setup whether you're a beginner or you just want a really simple build and it flies fantastic with Elevons only, the RC Powers F18, the whole uh, RC Powers fleet can all fly extremely well with Elevons only. The setup is just simple beyond belief. You only need of course the servo leads that are coming from the Elevons and you will plug one into the aileron slot on your receiver and the other into the elevator slot on your receiver and take it from there. You might find that you need to swap those around if you're getting the throws going in the wrong direction or you can also make some adjustments in the radio if you're comfortable with that. But if you're starting out or just want a simple build, you can't go past the Elevon only setup on the RC Powers planes. I'm just putting in the last of my connectors and this is for the rudder. I've used one of the Y splitter servo leads that came with the RC foam fly kit and that's all of my cables connected, my servo leads connected to the receiver. So I can now just power it up and see what happens. Because I've... Thank you. Because I've got a standardised wiring diagram, it's going to be pretty close. But if you're just doing this for the first time, you might find you spend a good deal of time mixing and matching, trying to get the connections in the right place. If you have a look at my diagram, it might be helpful. And um, it's, it's also a pertinent time to re-emphasise the value of labelling your servo leads so you know which one's which and where they're going to. Alright, so I've got the uh, power applied to the system with my standardised wiring setup and we'll just see how that shapes up. Don't worry if some of the control surfaces need to be trimmed and adjusted. We'll do that on the control linkages and further refine it in the radio if we need to. I just want to know if they're going in the right direction. So let's just try the um, Elevons first, see how they're going. That's working fine in all the directions that I'm after. Let's just try the rudders. Alright, they're also going in the correct direction. I do need to tighten up those linkages, they're moving around a bit, but uh, they're fine. And the last thing I wanted to check is if I use the ailerons setup, and I've got that set up as a switch in my radio. Everything's good. So I've managed to get it right. This is one of the advantages of having a standardised setup. Almost every time I do this, it comes out first time. But you may have to test your own and make some of your own, uh, your own adjustments. So with that done, I'm ready to tidy up the radio compartment and get everything Velcroed into place. Now that it's time to put all of the components into the battery bay, the electronics bay, I can start to take off any unnecessary cables I've got a number of servo extensions that I had on there just to make it easier to manage outside of the plane but I don't want that extra weight on board. So I'll now go ahead, remove any servo extension leads that I don't need and start to think about placing the components. I've already placed a piece of Velcro inside the aeroplane, I'll just tip this up just in here. Right at the early part of the video I said that you could put that down even before you make the fuse large. I just find it's easier to place it in once I'm all done. And I place it a little bit further to the rear than recommended in Dave Power's plans, but that's up to you. Uh, my build just comes out that way, not a problem. The other thing which is worth mentioning is that you've got to just roughly have an idea of where to place them so that your CG is correct. I go ahead, because I've built this plane quite a few times, I generally know how it's going to play out, but I place the battery in first, I've got the, um, the, the rough Velcro on the base of the battery bay. I always have the furry stuff on my batteries and other components. And oh, by the way, I'll just point this out while I've got it out. If you're not in the habit of labelling your batteries so you know when you bought it, you should. This for me tells uh, me that this was purchased in June of 2014. And this is number five in a group of six that I bought. I cycle my batteries through and keep a track of how many times I've used them. This one's getting a bit puffy and it'll probably be retired soon. That's a useful tip if you're um, not tracking your batteries. Not a bad idea to do that. All right, so I know that that battery is going to go roughly 
in the middle of the battery bay. That works for me, but I will make some adjustments now. And I also know that, because I've I'm used to wiring these things up, that I'm going to end up with my ESC somewhere near the back here, and likewise, just tuck that out of the way, and likewise my receiver is going to go towards the back here as well. So I'll end up with a nice sort of compression of all of that tagage, that uh, wiring and components to the rear, so I can get easy access into the battery area to pull it in and out. Now, I will then, with those roughly in place, just drop the hatch, doesn't matter if it won't close, and then I will um, lift the plane up and check the CG, placing my fingers on those little places where the plane should balance, and if it's out of whack, no problem, just go back in and work out where the best place to place the battery is. Once I've got it in the right place, I take a sharpie and I just make a mark, a little mark, to indicate where a 3S 2200 battery would go. I've also got plans to fly this with other batteries, maybe a 2S battery or even a 4S if I decided to put a bigger motor on. Whenever I use a new battery, double check the CG again and make a new mark in my battery bay so that when I'm at the field, I just drop the battery in and I know that it's very close to the spot, do a final check before I fly and then away we go. So now that I've got my rough placement sorted, I'm going to go ahead and tidy this up by placing some Velcro inside the bay to secure the ESC and the receiver and tidy up all my wiring. What I'm doing now is going around and just double checking that with the system energized, that is a battery connected to the ESC, and that in other words means that the servos are also energized, I go now to each of the control horns and if necessary, loosen them off and just move the whole assembly until I end up with the control surface flush with its main component. In this case, I'm making sure that the rudder is uh, is flat with the rest of the vertical stabilizer. When I'm content, I'll just lock it down. And I'm going to do that on all of the components, the alevons and the ailerons also. And with that done, you'll have much less trouble in trying to do your final trim when you get this thing in the air for the very first time on its maiden flight. I have to say that in my four of these that I've built, well this is the fourth, the three others that I've built, I have not had to do a single touch of trim straight off the bat, which is a testament to the design by Scott Lott and Dave Powers at RC Powers. It's a terrific design and it also makes me feel good because it means that the build is nice and tight. I'm going to get on with that same process on the rest of the control surfaces. When you come to adjust the linkages, the final check of the linkage lengths on the elevons, it's important to get these exactly the same. If they're out but at the, by the same amount, the two of them, well that's not so bad, but if one's out more than the other, that makes for all sorts of challenges when it comes to trim the aeroplane. So just grab yourself a little scrap of foam like I've got here, and one at a time, loosen off your linkage, and get the elevon where you think it needs to be. Good idea to start off over here on the outside just to give yourself a rough alignment. That looks pretty good. And once you're content, go ahead and tighten it back up at the linkage stopper. And then we're going to do the same over here. We're aiming to get them firstly.
correctly flat, that is in the same aspect as the engine deck, but importantly that they are both the same in terms of their inclination. As I said, if they are different, they are very hard to get uh, the trim correct. That looks good. And I'll lock that down. Once you've gone through and made sure you've got the control rods correctly installed so that the control surfaces are in the correct place with the system energised, it's time to go around and just trim off any excess you have on the control rods, particularly for the Elevon servos. If there's a long piece of metal or carbon fibre protruding out the back of the linkage on full elevation or depression, it may well be that that goes straight into the prop. So grab yourself your uh, cutters, go around and trim them off. And do the same for your other control rods. I've now just uh, installed the propeller onto the shaft. In doing so, I found it was just a little tight to get on. And uh, so, as a precaution, I just took another little shave of foam off um, the rear of the prop slot here. If you find you need to do that, just go ahead. Um, you've got the uh, spar here, and the servos about here, so there's still a bit of room, and that's now given the prop a bit more air. I'm just going to uh, use this little uh, metal rod that came in the RC Faux Fly kit. Just do the final tighten down. Support the motor while you do this. You don't want to be tearing the mount off at this stage of all your hard work. There we go. And we might just give it a little uh, test. Here we go. <coughs> Terrific. It's going in the correct direction. There's no impingement, there's no nothing catching. And uh, as a final check, I'll just uh, make sure that my Elevon controls are well clear and they are, so everything is fine. I just wanted to make sure those um, servo horns and control rods didn't come back. That's all good. So we've now got a prop installed, nicely balanced and tightened down, so that's great. Okay, we are almost there. One of the things that I do with my models, and a lot of guys do the same, is do a bit of final shaping of the foam on each of the leading edges and, and the wing area in particular to just shape it a bit better. You can absolutely leave it as it is stock. That is, you know, flat edges, no rounding of the forward edges of the wings or any rounding of the fuselage, it'll fly absolutely fine like that. It's just uh, something I like to do. I think it does reduce a little bit of drag and it also makes the plane look a little more pleasing to the eye. So we're going to get on with that now. Um, there is a bit of skill in this, but it's just a matter of practice. The key thing is to have a super sharp blade. I run my little blade out like this to its full extent. This is all fresh edge back in here so it's going to cut nice and straight. Now if you had a straight edge say the side of your fuselage you could use a steel edged ruler, steel ruler to give yourself a guide. What we're going to do is lay the blade at an angle in and then at a nice uh, gentle angle to the foam itself and slice away some of the foam. I've done a lot of this I'm happy to go freehand if I make a bit of a wobble I can always fix it up with some sandpaper and a bit of a trim. So, this is um, something you approach in, in increments. Don't you know gouge right into it on your first cut. Just uh, sneak up on it and see how you go. There we go, that's pretty good. We'll have another couple of um, passes of the blade. I'm going to do the underside as well, but you'll get the idea that that's uh, how we're going to get this thing shaped up. You might also care to have a go at rounding off some of the leading edges on the control surfaces 
say the um, the vertical fin here, the uh, the vertical stabiliser, and on the front of the the elevons there. If you are particularly keen, you can go ahead and round off the leading edge of your prop slot so that that provides slightly smoother air. All of these things I think add up in little increments. And the other thing that a lot of guys do, just uh, really to make the plane look that extra bit special, oh, here we go, is to work on the, uh, the front of the aeroplane around the, uh, the nose cone just to really give it a nice shape and that's a matter of running the blade along here maybe on the sides of your canopy um, shaping along the flanks here you can go as far as you like with this and then finishing off with a bit of sanding just to round it off it makes it look really nice the only thing I would caution is don't cut too deep in here because it's held together you might recall on a very thin edge by the glue so you don't want to go nuts and cut back into the glue and weaken the nose I mean if you crash it's going to get smashed anyway but let's not um, let's not increase the odds of this thing breaking so I'm not going to bore you now by going through every component of the uh, the shaping you get the idea I'll uh, get on with that now and if you choose to you can do the same Once you've got the, uh, the carving done and got it shaped up, just uh, a little bit of um, sandpaper. This is from the RC foam fly kit, which is quite handy, and a sanding block. And we just rub, rub it back to get a nice smooth finish. It's a bit like the blade. You've got to have it at an angle. If you sort of drive at it, it will catch because it's only soft foam. And you're better off having multiple swipes at it than one big hard hit. There we go. That feels lovely now. It's a nice rounded finish. Looks good and will fly through the air a bit better too. I've just about finished working my way around each of the leading edges for the elevons, for the vertical stabilizers and elsewhere on the plane. That's great, and a bit of sanding will bring those up nicely. You might also think about taking a little bit of foam off the trailing edge, particularly of the elevon, um, also maybe your ailerons. Greg, who's uh, F1 wannabe on the forums, has often remarked on the need to just shave a bit off here to shape the back so that the air isn't just sort of dropping off a sharp tail on the back there, sort of a real drop off and maybe creating some turbulence but just to ease the passage of that air by a nice shallow slope like this. And the same on the underside, just gives the air a smoother journey coming off the back of that control and uh, might make for a smoother flight. Okay, I've finished shaping and sanding all the leading edges of the plane and the fuselage, the wings, the vertical stabilizers, and also chamfered off a little bit on the back of each of the control surfaces. Can I just say to you that if this is your first build, don't do all that. It's only a few bonus points and isn't going to change particularly how the plane flies. If this is your first build, just leave it as it came off the production line. You know, square edges isn't going to change the world. Get it in the air and fly it because there's a good chance you'll crash it. And uh, you don't want to be sort of losing heart because you've spent hours on a beautiful finish to the plane only to see it uh, spud in um, after one or two flights. If this is, you know, your, your um, ent entry to the world of RC flying. So don't sweat it if you haven't uh, got the time or inclination to do this. It's perfectly fine, indeed, on some of my planes, I don't bother either. So, I think 
We are just about done. Our RC Powers F18 version 4 is now finished and it's gone extremely well. Made quicker by the use of the RC Foam Fly pre-cut kit and all of its components that came with it. That certainly made it quicker and easier for me and I really enjoyed the build. I hope you learned a lot from watching the build. I certainly uh, got a lot out of it too. Just putting it all together is great fun. So there we go, a fantastic looking plane. One that flies extremely well based on my experience of building this plane on several other occasions and I'm really looking forward to seeing this thing in the air in the maiden flight, which won't be too far away. Thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed it and take care.